one. We are live. Good evening and warm welcome to the 32nd session of Pediatric Orthopedic Active Learning Session. The aim of this lecture series is to connect trainees and young pedipods with the world experts. Enthusiastic trainees and consultants from India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Qatar, welcome Afghanistan. To the 32nd session of Pediatric Orthopedic Active Learning Session. The aim of this lecture series is to connect trainees and young pedipods with the world experts. Enthusiastic trainees and consultants from India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Qatar, Afghanistan. The second session of Pediatric Orthopedic Active Learning Session. Rishi, there is a problem. It's just repeating. The aim of this lecture series is to connect trainees and young pedipods with the world experts. Enthusiastic trainees and consultants from India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Qatar, Afghanistan, the second session of pediatric orthopedic activity. Yes, now I will continue. Yeah, so the expert for today's session is Jason Howard from Wilmington, Delaware, and he's going to speak on the evolving concept for the management of hip problem in cerebral palsy. And now I request uh, Professor Hitesh Shah to introduce our today's speaker. Over to you, Hitesh. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dhiran Bhai. And good morning to the Dr. Jason Howard. Uh, it is actually my fortunate to introduce Dr. Jason Howard. He's a good friend of mine. Actually, he's an academic pediatric orthopedic surgeon at numerous children hospital, Wilmington, Delaware. Previously, it was known as Alfred DuPont Hospital, Children Hospital. The few points for the Dr. Jason Hubbard that he has done his primary training in the Canada and then residency at the University of Callaway. After finishing his residency, he got trained under the prestigious institute in Royal Children Hospital, Melbourne, under the third ground. And after that, he did the pediatric spine fellowship in Auckland, New Zealand. Yeah, after that, he has done his services in the OMA, this uh, Qatar in Doha, where he has established academic in the Doha, and he has done the sabbatical leave, and after that, he got the train in the Switzerland for the pediatric hip preservation also. And he ha also has the degree in the electrical engineering and having studied in bar design also at Stanford University. His research interests are mainly focused on the basic science and epidemiological studies in cerebral palsy. One of the uh, peculiar part of the Dr. Jason Hubbard, he got the eastern side and western side the experience with uh, Dr. The Kurt Graham and Stephen Miller. So he can have the balance between the both eastern and western side. And we are fortunate to have him. And over to you, Dr. Jason. You can have a speak on the hip preservation, some of the what we know and what we don't know. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. And, you know, it, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. I thank you for the invitation to you and, and uh, Dr. Gondwala. Um, and it was so great to be with you in Wilmington uh, there a few months back. And I certainly learned a lot from you and I enjoyed our discussions in the operating room lounge. So hopefully we'll keep that going. Um, I'm going to share my screen here now, see if we can get this working. Um, can you all see that? Yes. Yep. So, um, yeah, I, I, one of my main, my main love in cerebral palsy is really to do with the hip. I, I treat kids with CP from the tip to the tail, including the spine, but I, I really uh, am interested in hip displacement since I think it has a very big impact on quality of life, particularly for our, our non-ambulatory kids and, um, and understanding it, identifying it, treating it well is important for, uh, you know, for their independence for their, and for their quality of life to have a pain-free mobile hip. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we know what we don't know and where we may be going or where I think we should go. I uh, have some disclosures there. This is, um, you know, on the, on the right-hand side here is where 
is the uh, DuPont Institute. So when I was training, uh, you know, this was a, this was kind of a storied institution for me. And I never, ever thought I would get the opportunity to work here uh, at this place with such the such a legacy of people and also what they've done for pediatric orthopedics on the global stage. This is it on the left now. You can see it's a, been a modernized uh, front face to it. And uh, and we've changed our name, unfortunately, to Nemours Children's Hospital, Delaware. Um, but uh, the ethos is still there. And uh, I'm lucky enough to work with great people like Wade Schrader, Freeman Miller, and uh, our great cerebral palsy team. So uh, I bring a lot of their thoughts as well to this. And as um, uh, as Dr. Shaw had mentioned, uh, my uh, mentor, Kirk Graham, has had a lot to do with how I have shaped my approach to children with CP over the decades um, and with a little of my own flair in there perhaps as well. So hip displacement's common and it's silent. So we need radiographs really to pick it up at that early stage. About 35% of all kids with CP have uh, or will develop hip displacement. And those who are non-ambulatory at highest risk. And in the past, before the GMFCS, we used the you know, a topographic pattern, such as quadriplegia, diplegia, hemiplegia, to help uh, discern the disease severity and how it might relate to hip displacement. And we're looking at the uh, geometry of not only the, uh, the, the acetabulum, which you can see here has some significant dysplasia posterior laterally, but also the dysplasia of the proximal femur, which as you'll learn is, is becoming more and more important in our, in our thoughts about etiology and, uh, and what actually causes hip displacement. Here, the, unlike developmental hip dysplasia, you know, the, these hips are typically normal at birth. Here's a, here's a child who's GMFCS level three actually, uh, who at age four had a pretty normal hip. You can see that on the left-hand side. And as the, she goes up in age five, seven, nine, and uh, about nine and a half, it's, it, the hip actually dislocates. You can see some femoral head there starting to uh, wear away laterally. And she, it, she finally got a an, an, uh, reconstruction at that point. And thankfully we were able to save her hip, but it was kind of at the edge there. And you can imagine that this hip was fairly degenerated in its cartilage. Um, the the kind of the consistent narrative about how these hips come out of the joint is that you have spastic hip flexors and adductors, which put the hip in an abnormal position, which I think is still correct uh, with respect to the direction of displacement. But it may not be the whole story as to why hips displace, as you'll find out. The reason why we care about hip displacement is because of things like this. You can see in the top right picture, this is a femoral head that is, has been um, exposed through a Watson-Jones type approach at the time of a salvage surgery. And you can see the femoral head has a huge gouge in the side of it. The, the cartilage is basically non-existent. It's ebernated. And this child had a lot of pain, couldn't sleep at night, and uh, really was at the point where they needed something done. This child was not picked up by a hip surveillance program, unfortunately, and was living in a rural area and only came to us after she had such severe pain and such deformity that really nothing else could be done except for a salvage procedure. The, the forces in the hip and CP are quite high too. Actually, Dr. Miller did a study on this back in 1999, which showed that there are six times what we typically would see in a typically developing hip. The pain that happens often occurs in the early teens, and you really wanna to get to these uh, hips before you get pain, because once there's pain there, you know there's been cartilage degeneration. Although some studies say that there's not much pain in these hips, if you look at the ones that are are long-term population-based, about 90% of children with hip displacement and CP will go on to pain. And this is linked to progressive osteoarthritis. So we try and catch these kids early and do prophylactic surgery to prevent that uh, natural history. If you look at what causes hip pain, it may not be exactly what you think. Um, certainly there's cartilage uh, degeneration, but it's not the lo excessive loading of the hip that causes that degeneration, but it's the unloaded segment. So if you look at these hips at, um, during surgery, if you've dislocated the hip and are, are going to 
um, you know, do a salvage procedure, for example, you'll see that that the part of the head, head that's uncovered is the one that doesn't have the cartilage on it. If you don't load the cartilage, it will lose its nutrition and kind of delaminate easily. There's also some mechanical abutment involved with that, of course, um, but that displacement is important for that. And although it seems intuitive that it would be the actual joint surface and cartilage that would be causing the pain group from Poland really found that it's 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 likely the periarticular tissue that has the nociceptors involved there. And uh, and this starts, you start to see things like substance P and S100 as these uh, substances associated with that after about 25% of the cartilage damage. And this is much worse in CP than you would see in, uh, in kids with DDH with similar amounts of cartilaginous damage. So C kids with CP hurt more. So how do we how do we find these kids before they get into trouble? Well, you know, there are some registries around the world now. The, the most famous, I guess, was one I had the luxury of being involved with, which was in the state of Victoria in, um, in Australia. Uh, and that, uh, that register captured all the children with cerebral palsy in the state of Victoria in Australia. So we caught everybody. So we would know the de denominator of those kids. And so we could really get a good idea of what is the true incidence of hip dysplasia in that population. And it's important to get that denominator and know what the risks are for hip displacement so you can to determine what, how to do hip surveillance by radiographs to be able to detect them at an early uh, state before you end up with hips that look like this one. Uh, where it's it looked pretty good on an X-ray, but actually when you when you uh, go to reconstruct it, you see that it's very um, uh, severely uh, uh, dysplastic with no cartilage at all. And this one underwent a conversion to a castle procedure. So two innovations changed everything with respect to the hip, and this is commonplace now. But when I started my um, practice, you know, 20 years ago, and when I was in residency, the gross motor function classification system really didn't hit its stride. It is a very important system, which we take for granted now. Um, and it looks at gross motor function and self-initiating movement function and sitting, standing and walking, and whether or not you need walking aids or wheel mobility in CP. And it's very reliable and it's easy to assign. Even orthopedic surgeons can do it. And the cartoons that we introduced in our hip, dis uh, hip displacement incident article have helped with that, I think. From the GMFCS, uh, from the GMFM, the, uh, which our PTs use a lot, the GMFCS was derived into these five uh, levels, which have become integral to give us that common language, uh, how to describe kids with uh, CP and their disease. So the disease severity for the hip uh, register and CP, as I was talking about in Victoria, we used uh, motor type topography, GMFCS in the whole uh, population and uh, found out what the percentage of hip displacement was based on whether or not they had hip displacement by the Rymer's migration percentage. And when we looked at that whole population, uh, we found this amazing curve. And I was, uh, I was a fellow with Kirk Graham at the time, and I really didn't realize how important this study was going to be until I saw this graph. Myself and Brendan Sue had just finalized the x-ray measurements of this, and we plotted it out. And I remember running to Professor Graham saying, oh, my God, this the incidence of hip displacement is directly linear to GMFCS level, which was a brand new thing that we were using in CP at the time. And I think it helped kickstart the use of this classification system in all of our other, other aspects and communications. But this provided the foundation for a surveillance system. And there's since been a few other centers, particularly in Sweden, who have uh, repeated this and have found very similar numbers. So it gives it some uh, validity. And that was the basis of HIP surveillance guidelines. Most, most the earliest ones were from Australia. It basically meant if you're ambulatory, you don't need, you don't need many x-rays. And if you're non-ambulatory, you need a lot more x-rays at more frequent intervals to make sure that you pick up the risk of hip displacement. And the idea was to identify hips at risk, treat them early, and uh, hopefully get better outcomes. In addition to uh, just having hip displacement, 
if you look at the pathoanatomy of the proximal femur and the acetabulum, there are changes also associated with uh, GMFCS level. For kids who are non, or non-ambulatory, such as the GMFCS level fours and fives, the femoral antiversion is 40 degrees. And the neck shaft angle or coxa valga associated is also very high and linearly related to GMFCS level. Even in the lower GMFCS levels, uh, which may be surprising, even GMFCS level one, the uh, the uh, femoral neck antiversion is still 30 degrees, which is more than twice normal. So that's, uh, that's something to be, keep in mind when you're treating these kids. The acetabulum also changes with GMFCS and with MP. And although we most often consider acetabular deficiency in cerebral palsy to be located posteriorly, it's actually anterior in 35%. And we just uh, actually uh, did a, an anterior hip dislocation just last week uh, where we had to do a Pemberton style acetabuloplasty rather than our traditional DEGA slash San Diego. Uh, and it can be globally deficient, meaning the whole acetabulum is dysplastic and flat in about 8% of kids. And those are typically the kids with hypotonic uh, hips, the ones that are not so much with hip dysplasia or with uh, spasticity, I meant to say. And all of these indices and, and 3D CT uh, had worsened with GMFCS level in these Korean studies. Traditionally, MRSA rang really uh, helped us to understand. Uh, what I call the three stages of cerebral palsy. Stage one would be where you have a spastic muscle contracture. So you've got spasticity, say in the hip adductors, but it's not yet short. That happens in stage two where the spasticity decreases a little bit, but the muscle actually becomes short and uh, the range of motion decreases. So you get scissoring and the like. And then stage four would be the, in, under the influence of that spasticity and muscle contractures that you get hip displacement, you would get uh, the hip coming out, femoral head coming out of the joint and, uh, and causing dislocation. And that seems very intuitive. And, that's, and so if you do things like inject botulinum toxin or do adductor surgery, for example, we should be able to, at stage one, we should be able to stop stage two and stage three. So everything should be good. And indeed, Mercer Rang felt that if you do hip adductor surgery early, then you should be able to uh, completely uh, reduce the risk and eliminate the risk of these hips coming out of the joint. It was just a matter of early surveillance and early treatment. Unfortunately, as, as pretty well everybody here probably knows, it's not quite that simple. And the question I was asking myself is why? So this is the traditional view for hip prophylactic treatment, as we'll find, may not be as true as we thought, although it seems to make sense uh, it, uh, it doesn't hold up as well as uh, I was originally taught. Because if you look at the, the treatment of hip adductor spasticity, very reliably, say with botulinum toxin, which does a great job of, of reducing spasticity, in this randomized controlled trial, a 10-year follow-up from the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, they found that it did not prevent hip displacement at all. It didn't change the need for hip surgery and didn't change, uh, didn't improve hip morphology, whether you had no surgery, preventative surgery, which would be adductor releases alone, or reconstructive surgery. So if it's expensive drug and, um, you know, it gives you transient reduction in spasticity, but that didn't really help. And they used the swash type brace to um, also as an adjunct. So, um, it, they did, however, people who cite this study often say there's a delay in, there was a delay in the need for adductor surgery by 18 months. So that's one positive benefit of botulinum toxin. But you know, I would say practically as a surgeon, anything you do as an intervention, you're gonna wait at least a year to a year and a half to see what happens before you do the next thing. So that delay in 18 months may be more just a practical thing. But at the end of 10 years follow-up, Botox didn't do anything to hip displacement. We recently looked at reducing spasticity by intrathecal baclofen. At uh, DuPont, we uh, were big proponents of using intrathecal baclofen. It works well in, uh, in symptomatic spasticity and helps with positioning. And we think in quality of life, but what does it do to the hip? So we looked at our population within uh, Nemours, 135 children with, uh, in GMFCS level fours and fives, 
who had a hip, an ITB pump, and we matched them to those who didn't have an intrathecal baclofen pump. So intra, for those who don't know, intrathecal baclofen is a catheter with a with a, a reservoir which is which is uh, delivers baclofen, a gabapentin agonist, directly to the spinal cord, and uh, it really reduces spasticity well. Uh, but we found, unfortunately, that it didn't do anything to hip displacement either. And there was no difference in the risk or progression of hip displacement or the need for hip surgery between groups. So botulinum toxin didn't work. Baclofen doesn't work. Two ways to reduce seductive spasticity. And uh, so what about another way? So, so this is a recent article by my good friend, uh, uh, Kishra Malpuri and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, um, Stacy Miller. Where, from University of British Columbia, where they looked at their uh, group of kids who had SDR, selective dorsal rhizotomy. Another way to reduce SD by central nerve roots uh, in the lower um, lumbar spine. And they found that if you look at the risk of uh, hip displacement in their population, and they do have a population-based register there, they found that those patients who had SDR ended up having the exact same incidence of, of uh, hip displacement as we found in our Melbourne study. And in fact, here I, I overlaid our, uh, our study results from 2006, and you can say that, see that it's exactly the same. And they concluded that hip displacement post-dorsal rhizotomy was associated with GMFCS level and consistent with um, other studies that didn't have SDR. So, that, so that's another way to, to uh, get rid of uh, hip displacement, or sorry, get rid of spasticity, which also didn't uh, help with hip displacement. So spasticity is not really the cause, but we still have to treat it. So, you know, the framework that uh, that Dr. Miller and Mercer Rang put together, along with Kirk Dabney, back in a, or the mid-90s, I think, still holds up, where we looked at preventative um, hip displacement, or sorry, preventative procedures, reconstructive procedures, and salvage procedures. So preventive would be soft tissue, reconstructive would be osteotomies, and salvage would be removing the, the joint itself. And uh, so if you haven't read this before, I would, I would encourage you to read this chapter in Epp's book. So we're going to look at preventative first. And preventative, I have in quotation marks because I just told you that actually doing adductor surgery alone did not prevent hip displacement in soft tissue. Re so these soft tissue releases, though, are important particularly to help reduce the hip when you are um, uh, doing hip reconstructive surgery, as you can see here. Um, just give me, sorry, just give me one second. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to let my family know. Hey, guys, I'm doing a talk in India right now. Can you guys keep it down? Sorry, this is what you do when you're home on Zoom, isn't it? <laughs> but anyways, here we go. So uh, um, these preventative soft tissue releases give you good results in early studies, but this was pre-GMFCS where they used topographic pattern with poor reliability. They mixed ambulatory and non-ambulatory together. So these early studies with so good results really don't hold up when you do it based on GMFCS level. But this is how you do it. You release the adductor longus. You would go in the interval between the adductor brevis and pectineus. You release the, uh, the uh, iliopsoas and then the gracilis, the proximal hamstring there. And this is a, 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 you need to do this as a prerequisite to doing soft tissue, to doing reconstructive surgery. But if you look at the survival of adductor surgery, it is linked to the GMFCS. As you can see here by Ben Shore's article, the only ones that did really well were GMFCS level twos, and everybody else had a poor survivorship after adductor surgery alone. So again, like other things, hip displacement is linked to GMFCS level. So with that in mind about adductor spasticity reduction, either by surgery or by non-surgical means, I would say you know, to you to think clearly and maybe challenge that traditional view of spasticity leading to hip displacement as the primary etiology. Because if you looked at the, our our uh, work, for example, in our incident study, we found that if you look at it by motor type, hypotonic motor type, those without spasticity, had the same risk of hip displacement as those with spasticity. So that doesn't seem to, to add up too much if you're thinking about the traditional view. We surmised that a lack of weight-bearing abductor insufficiency 
deficiency and femoral deformity may be more causative. If you look at these two um, pictures here, you've got spinal muscular atrophy type one on the left side, that x-ray. You can see the growth plate is outlined there. It's quite laterally tilted. You've got hip displacement, an MP of about 50%. And on the right side is GMFCS level five, eight years old, a little older, but fairly similar features, that lateral physeal tilt, acetabular dysplasia, coxa valga. And uh, Tonus had actually described this back uh, in the early 80s. And, uh, and suggested that this lateral physeal tilt was associated with abductor insufficiency, leading to coxa valga with pressure on acetabulum, dysplasia, et cetera. But, you know, we kind of learn things and then we forget them, don't we? But uh, it, this, is not, this is not new thinking. It's just uh, showing a spotlight on things that have been said before. Here's our study. You can see hypotonic at 44% risk of hip displacement and hypertonic is at around the same. So uh, this is, uh, how do we explain this if it's just about spasticity? Hip geometry, I've become very interested in hip geometry, not only in CP, but in other neuromuscular diagnosis, because we're seeing the same uh, pattern in, uh, in all, uh, hip, all this neuromuscular hip dysplasia, particularly with SMA and other muscle diseases. You can see that lateral physeal tilt, an increase in the head shaft angle and coxa valga and acetabular dysplasia. And there are studies that have shown increased abductor weakness with GMFCS level and SMA type, which is contributing to that lateral tilting of the physis and the resultant force. Normally the head shaft angle, as you can see here, decreases with age in typically developing children. And so keep that in mind when I show you these next pictures. So we want, if you haven't seen this, to see some of the ideas about what I'm talking about today, you may want to have a look at this. It's open access in the Journal of Children's or uh, Orthopedics back um, last year, where we looked at the kids with spinal muscular atrophy and we compared them, matched them to a group with GMFCS um, levels four and five to types one and two SMA. And you know, we found we found that things were very similar. We found the head shaft angle started high and stayed high for CP and SMA. And along with that, we got increases in MP, which increased by age for both, but more rapidly in SMA, despite it having low tone. And if you look at the acetabular index or the acetabular dysplasia, that was correlated to, mi to migration percentage for both SMA and CP. So it seems like we, it's not just spasticity, it's that proximal femoral geometry, which may be the major problem and may be related to uh, a lack of functional weight bearing and abductor weakness. So I would say I would say to you that it's more than just the adductors, and we see the development of hip displacement common to both hypertonic and hypotonic. And although adductor spasticity may be added, it's not the primary driver. So if it's not just the adductors, then what? What can we do now? Uh, we have these young kids who have hip displacement. And if adductors alone are not going to do it, we have to find some other way to, to deal with these hips. Because if you do hip reconstructive surgery, like varus derotational osteotomies, acetabuloplasties, and kids who are under age six, you've got a very high risk of recurrence. You're probably going to have to do it again when they're 10. And most, most families will tell you, this is the most painful thing they go through, go through in their surgical journey as a kid with CP, and you really don't wanna do this twice for them. And it's never as good the second time around. So we need something to temporize in these younger children. So in kid, kids older than six years old, bony reconstruction is a thing to do. But under age six, we've been starting to use, uh, over the last four or five years, we've been using guided growth as a means to be able to treat the uh, this lateral physeal tilt in those young kids where they still have a lot of growth remaining. To as an augment to an adductor surgery to help uh, delay or ho hopefully even definitively treat hip displacement. So I'm going to show you what Dr. Schrader calls my home run case. Although we have many other cases which have uh, just as dramatic, I think this shows up very well. This is one of our early cases which kind of said, well, there's something going on here. There's something happening that's good. Um, so here we are. Here's a child who's 27 months of age. You see he's, he's uh, basically subluxated. She's subluxated there or dislocated. 
So we decided we're going to do an adductor release and we're going to do guided growth for that. Seemed like a bit of a stretch, but maybe it would give us some time. So here's the technique. We do an arthrogram through a medial approach. That's with 50% of dilute um, uh, OmniPAC in our, in our uh, case. And you don't want to inject too much because you want to be able to coat the femoral head so you can really see the epiphysis well. And the reason for that is to get as long a screw in there as possible. You can see in this case that there's a lot of medial dye pooling there. Uh, so you can see that instability. And you can see the acetabular on logi there too, that blunting of the lateral aspect of the acetabulum, which is pushing up and quite flat. And as we abduct the hip after our adductor release, you can see how it, this, this, is un, uh, this goes in very nicely. And you can see that patchless capsule above with the dye there and the, um, and the uh, acetabular on logi upsloping and blunted. So now we're ready to put in our cannulated screw, which we do percutaneously. Usually we use a 4.5 millimeter screw, except if they're really young. And we use a 4.0 fully threaded screw so you can get it out again. And uh, you can see we put it in for immediately. And we want to put it right up to the joint surface. Want to get as many threads as possible across this epiphysis because the growth is so um, significant at this age that it will pull out quite quickly if you only get one or two threads across there. Uh, and if you just use the uh, x-rays without the arthrogram, you know, all you see is that little bit of inframedial epiphysis, which makes you nervous about putting longer screws in. But here we are, you can see we've got, oh, I don't know, it looks like about seven or eight threads there. And we have bone on both sides of the thread. So this is a good placement of the screw in for immediately. And, and I put it on both sides. As you can see, the, the right side wasn't as bad as the left, but uh, it definitely was still needed some help. And uh, so we'll see how that works over time. So here we are immediately pre-op. You see here, and look at this, 26 months post-op. Uh, you can see that the the uh, the displacement is almost completely resolved. I have uh, I actually just saw this girl last week. She's now three almost three years postoperatively, and th that MP is basically ten percent. And I removed her screw. She she actually is finished her treatment, but now I'm watching her for a rebound because I don't know what's going to happen in the long term. Is this a lasting solution? You know, do we need to keep the screw in there for longer? Uh, or you know, is it good to just take it out? These are questions we don't know the answers to at this point. But when you see cases like this, you say there is something compelling here. And the, not only does the hip go in the joint, but the acetabular index also responds and decreases uh, uh, with respect to that, further cementing the fact that this is the proximal femoral geometry correction, which is the uh, primary driver. So time to take the screw out. Usually we do that at eight, one to two years of age, um, one to two years after surgery, depending on the age, because the younger they are, the faster their growth is and the faster they will pull this, they'll outgrow the screw need to be changed. But you also get the better correction in those younger patients. So, oh, sorry, I did put in the, uh, I did put in our finals. So this is just from last week. Uh, we removed the screw at 32 months. And you can see her there. Maybe she's got a 15 to 20% migration percentage now. And the head's a little wider, the neck's a little shorter. And that's as, as a result of sort of tethering the growth. But I'd take this over the, over the uh, alternative, doing early V-DROs and acetabuloplasties, which I know I'll have to do again later on. And uh, this was basically an outpatient procedure and uh, the family couldn't be happier. So what is the evidence for guided growth as a prophylactic treatment? Well, it's not great, to be honest. There was a systematic review done recently um, uh, by uh, Pranay uh, Budev and, and, uh, and his people in London. And they found the modest improvements in MP from 35% to 26%. The head shaft angle did improve quite a bit from 162 to 149. And the acetabular index also improved only by four degrees. You know, is that is that clinically significant? But the problem with their study and all the previous literature to this point is the mean age of surgery is quite high, 7.2, um, which is older than six years of age when we would typically do a hip reconstruction. At this point, the, we all know that that physis really doesn't grow very much. It's only responsible for about 20% of all the femoral growth. But when you're younger, when you're under age three, 
that that uh, growth is more of a 50-50. So you got 50% from the proximal femur, 50% from the distal femur. And that's why I think we're getting such robust changes in those young children that we're not seeing in the older ones. In fact, I remember as a fellow in Melbourne, we did some guided growth screws because Ian Tarot was doing it for caput valgum and DDH had some success. But we didn't see it going anywhere. But again, those kids were like eight and nine years old. And they were, I think it was just too old at that point. Um, so we're really concentrating on the younger kids and seeing great results with that. So here's that kid. If you put them, uh, you know, in a long, uh, in a line of how they've changed from pre-op to 32 months post-op, you can see how that hip changed over time. It's not a normal hip at the end of it all, but it is uh, mobile, pain-free, and uh, with normal range of motion and for an outpatient procedure, which the patient barely felt what was going on. So that was a, I think this is a win for young kids with CP and it also works for kids with hypotonia. So, you know, those kids that don't have adductor contractures and their hips are falling out of their joint. What do you do with them? You can leave them and see how they do over the longer term, or you had this guided growth to help you. So here's a child, for example, who had delayed onset of walking at two years old, hypotonic, and then had progressive increase in her migration percentage. We did a guided growth screw, which looks like it's in the joint, but it's actually not. Remember that arthrogram we did? Uh, and at four years of age, she's got a normal uh, migration percentage at, at uh, 26 months post-op. And we took the screw out and she's done. This was percutaneous. She got a tiny one centimeter incision and uh, she's on her merry way. So no other contractures with progressive displacement. At last, we have a treatment option, but it only works in those younger kids. Here's our head shaft angle looking at the physis. And you can see it's laterally tilted when we started 175 degrees and now 156 degrees at the end. So tilting medially the way it's supposed to do in typically developing kids. But nothing's for free. I mentioned the, the widening of the head and the, um, and the proximal femur changes. You can see that, you know, that growth plate that we forget about on the lateral aspect of the femoral neck, uh, when you tether the, uh, the distal growth plate, you, that, that growth plate tends to add in there. So it makes the head wider, it makes the neck wider. And this continues to grow even when the kids are older. So, you know, we were taught, at least I was taught that that growth plate kind of goes away and is not really that important. I can tell you it's, it is very important and continues to, to take part in the growth of the proximal femur as you, as you go. So, but this needs further study as to what the, these changes will mean for the long term for these kids. So here's our DuPont guided, guided growth indications based on what we know right now. So as a primary treatment in that young patient, 18 months of age to about five to six years old, and the MP greater than 40, less than 70, although you did say we have been pushing the envelope on that, GMF, CS level fours and five, we're doing traditional adductor releases, proximal femoral releases, uh, sorry, uh, hip flexor releases, if you have contractures, uh, along with guided growth. Uh, another time we are using it is if we, after VDRO in a younger patient, we see a, the uh, head starting to come out of the joint again, then we will put a screw in there to stop that uh, progression, uh, even in the older kids. Um, and that just can help maybe prevent a recurrence and need for new, for, for uh, uh, revision, reconstruction. Okay, so that's guided growth. Um, sorry, I've taken a bit of time with that. I'm gonna give, give you a little bit of overview of just principles of reconstructive surgery. And uh, we'll have some time for some questions at the end. So reconstructive surgery, as I mentioned, if they're over age six, we will reconstruct them. That means we'll do osteotomies, the femur, the acetabulum, along with soft tissue balancing to um, put the hips in the joint and maintain them there. And you can see the coxa valga, the acetabular dysplasia, femoral head deformity. And you know, in younger patients, our stalling tactics, as we talked about, are guided growth and after surgery. The principles of hip reconstruction are you need to do it before the femoral head and that's to have them too deformed if you want to get good results. You use the varus derotational osteotomy to reduce the hip. 
And if you're looking for a target for neck, neck shaft angle uh, to, to, to uh, reduce the varus to, for me, it's pretty simple. If it's a GMFCS level one to three, I shoot for 120 degrees neck shaft angle, a four, 110, and a five, 100. What's the science behind that? I have none, just experience, but it seems to work and it's uh, easy to remember. So I would suggest you could use that too if you wanted to. So reduce the hip with the adductor releases and the varus uh, proximal femur. And then you do the acetabular plasty for stability. So you stabilize the hip with your acetabulum. And if you do have adductor contractures, then do those first. And you derotate the femur antiversion from about 40 degrees, as we, as we looked at earlier, to around 10 degrees uh, antiversion, which is more typical. You have to be careful not to retrovert the uh, femur when you do your derotation, since you can put the hip out the back of the joint by doing that. So here's reducing the hip with VDRO. I stole a few, a few quotes from the hip book that uh, Dr. Gandwala was, was talking about earlier. So I think it, it kind of gives the principles really well. But here, you, you know, here we are, dislocated hip. You know, with we do the adductor release and, and see, well, does it reduce? Yes, this reduces. So if it didn't reduce into the socket at this point, then you know, well, I've got to do an open reduction. But most of the time, I would say about 95% of the time, you do not need to do an open reduction if you get to these hips at a reasonable time frame. So you put a we use a we use a blade plate. We like to use the orthopediatrics blade plate for this. And I do a transverse cut, shorten it by about a centimeter or so, more if need be, and then do a parallel cut halfway across uh, in line with the um, the chisel. And then we derotate it to about 10 degrees, as I mentioned to you. And now we've got our reduction. Now we got to check the stability. So we've reduced the hip, but is it stable? So we do an arthrogram to assess the need for an acetabuloplasty. And then let's check the stability here. So you can see that arthrogram shows you the acetabular labrum pretty well. That's very stable now after the VDRO on the contralateral side. So that's good. But what about on, on the, the left side? Let's see. So you can see not as great a labrum here, upsloping. And you see now this is unstable. So we know this one needs an acetabular plasty for, st for stability. So let's see what we do here. So we do a San Diego style acetabular plasty, where we just uh, go around the cup, hinge on the triurated cartilage. Here's a laminar spreader bringing it down. And then we put an allograft, uh, a tricortical allograft in there to hold it in place. And there's what it looks like. Um, and you can see we, we incise the, in, the anterior inner table and the posterior inner table through the notch to get our maximum uh, dosage of the acetabuloplasty. And here we are now. Oops, sorry about that. So here we are after acetabuloplasty. I'm trying to push it out of the joint. Now we've got it stabilized. So the acetabulum stabilizes the hip. The varus uh, osteotomy reduces the hip. Here we are. We got stability achieved. Nine years of age, this should this should last. But if you're looking for a rule of thumb, then you know if you you know your your indication for acetabuloplasty after VDRO and adductor release is if it's unstable, like you saw there, if it's uncovered more than thirty percent, or has an acetabular index more than thirty degrees. If you have those things, then you should perform a pelvic osteotomy. You can use a cannulated blade plate. Uh, or you can use a um, those uh, proximal femoral locking plates. They seem to work just as well. Depends on what you're used to. But if you're going to do it, you do it bilaterally. If you only do a unilateral procedure, you'll you'll affect the pelvic obliquity, shortening one side while leaving the other side long, and about 44 percent will will displace contralaterally. So do it bilaterally. What about the arthrogram? I showed you the arthrogram is really useful in um, those kids. Oh, we were trying to determine stability in the younger kids. And sometimes it's useful if you're not sure if you need an acetabuloplasty in the really young kids. If they're under age six and you have to do uh, a VDRO, but you don't want to do an acetabuloplasty, you can do a, um, an arthrogram. You can see here we've done after VDRO. And you can see that nice acetabular on log is pretty good. It looks way better than it looks like on a plain film. And the head's in. 
abductor wedge. And over time, you can see that you can get remodeling in that younger kid. It's better under age six. But as I mentioned to you, we're typically doing guided growth for these for these patients now. So this might be something that, you know, uh, I don't need to think about too much anymore, but it's useful if you get yourself in that situation. Hip reconstruction, quality of life is improved. That's been shown in multiple studies, better not only for pain, but for personal care, activities, daily living, positioning, transfers, mobility. And if you have an MP greater than 50%, your quality of life is worse. So you really want to and make sure you reduce that hip well after, after surgery. What about femoral head shape? There's some controversies here. You know, here's the head shape deformity in a child that we removed, it did a, a, a McHale style procedure for severe pain. You know, and a lot of people are saying, you, you know, you don't need to do this anymore because Dr. Rutz, who I think you're having your, as your speaker soon, had found that preoperative femoral head shape had no impact on the outcomes of hip reconstruction. But if you look at their paper carefully, they actually said it had no income on the improvement of pain after hip reconstruction. Um, so I'm not sure that that anecdotally in, in our hands that this is always the case that you can just put whatever head you want back in the acetabulum. We're still seeing kids with a lot of discomfort. So I think carefully about this before I reconstruct. Uh, but what we don't know is does femoral head shape worsen after skeletal maturity? Does surgery prevent it? Does residual femoral head shape have an impact on osteoarthritis? We tried to look at this using Eric's uh, classification, uh, femoral head shape classification. We, we uh, stratified them into less severe head shapes, more severe head shapes, and looked at the change in femoral head shape from triradic cartilage closure, so after they became mature, to final follow-up. And you know, we found that actually, the if you had an MP greater than 30%, when your triradic cartilage, cartilage was closed, i.e. after skeletal maturity, then you had a high risk of having progressive femoral head shape uh, uh, getting more severe, even after skeletal maturity. And uh, so you, you need to really think about that as your threshold. And also the arthritis was worse in those cases as well. So arthritis was more severe with more severe femoral head shape. We didn't have good pain outcome scores, unfortunately. So that's the next step to figure that out to make sure that our, arthro, our, our radiographic signs of arthritis are also causing clinical problems. So efforts should be made to fully contain these hips. You can't just leave it hanging around 40%. And I think that threshold is probably wrong. It should be, we're, it should be less. It should be less than 30% is what we're finding to help preserve the femoral head shape and decrease the risk of femoral osteoarthritis. But we need a lot more studies to to look at that more carefully. So here's a kid who had trivator cartilage closure at age 13 and a half. And despite it being um, uh, that, that uh, despite skeletal maturity, he went on to dislocation, had to have subsequent hip reconstruction. Well, that's not supposed to happen, is it? Uh, we've been told that after skeletal maturity, then they should be okay. But our studies have found that actually, the need for hip surveillance continues in these kids uh, if their migration percentage is greater than, um, than 30% at triradic cartilage closure. We found that about 22% of them will continue to progress even if uh, they're finished their growth, if they have that higher MP. And so we really should try and get those uh, that MP down below that level of 30%. Uh, before saying we're completely done with these patients and we don't need to do any more x-rays after skeletal maturity. Males didn't do as well either. Uh, and if you had reconstructive surgery prior to triradic cartilage closure, well, that was actually quite protective. Um, so it's a good thing to get those hips in before skeletal maturity. What about the spine? Well, a lot of times people say, well, don't worry about your hips because I'm going to fix your scoliosis and your spot, your and your hips will get better. So we weren't sure about that. There wasn't a lot of uh, studies on that really worked that out. So uh, actually, Dr. Schrader uh, and uh, and me and others uh, looked at this carefully to look at it. Well, what's the what is the relationship between hip and spine? You know, is it that we need to do the spine first, or do we do the hips first? Here's a case where we did had windswept hips. We, we reconstructed them and then built the spine above, and that worked out really well. But is that always the case? 
we got to look at infra pelvic obliquity. So is this a stiff hips or is it super pelvic, a stiff spine or both to get good outcomes? So who's on first, hip versus spine? You know, typically if they both happen together, uh, we suggest you doing the spine first because we found that number one, the hip, uh, sorry, spinal uh, surgery had no real effect on hip displacement, didn't make it worse, didn't make it better. So don't do the hip, don't do the spine to, to treat the hips, treat them separately. But the, the spine is, scoliosis surgery is less painful than hip reconstruction. So if you're trying to ease a patient into the surgical journey, then doing the spine first, they're most worried about that. But when they find it's not as bad as they thought, then it makes the hip reconstructive surgery that much easier. And then, so if you do the spinal surgery, then you follow up with the hip reconstructive six months later. And please don't do this together. The, the heterotopic ossification and blood loss makes this a risky operation to do. And here's, uh, here's that study I talked to you about, you know, uh, looking at the hip displacement. And basically, if you do the spinal surgery, whether you need hip, hip surgery afterwards or not is the same. So thank you for that. I'm going to just go. So what do we know? Just in summary, I think we know that hip displacement is common and is directly linked to the GMFCS level. Hip displacement in spastic CP leads to pain. The the treatment of adductor spasticity, however, does not correct hip displacement. Hip reconstruction improves your quality of life, and it's best if you do it before age six, six to reduce the risk of recurrence. An MP greater than 30% is really the tipping point. So after that uh, point, if you leave a hip of more than 30%, increased risk of femoral head dysplasia, arthritis, and hip displacement after skeletal maturity. What don't we know? What about hip displacement and hypotonic CP? It looks the same, but is it painful? Should we even treat it? There's not great studies on that. Who shouldn't get a hip reconstruction? Some of our kids may be just too medically fragile to go through this big operation. Should we actually put them through this? Do the risks outweigh the benefits? I think we don't know that. Femoral head dysplasia and pain. When is it too late to reconstruct? You can see some of the things I showed today show that you can get, you will get more arthritis with more femoral head dysplasia, but how does that relate to the patient? What are the long-term results of guided growth of the proximal femur? It looks pretty good on x-rays, but will it last? Or is it just a temporizing measure? And am I going to have to do VDROs in the future? I don't know the answer to that question yet. Hip displacement in ambulatory patients, especially hemiplegia, the gauge, winter gauge Hicks 4 uh, hemiplegia, What's the risk of hip displacement? When can we stop hip surveillance for them? That's not been focused on. Scoliosis and pelvic obliquity as an etiologic factor. Although I said that it doesn't look like it changes the um, amount of hip displacement, is it just a marker of disease severity or is there something more involved there? We know pelvic obliquity is a risk factor for uh, hip surveillance uh, uh, programs. So where are we going? I think we need to further our understanding of proximal femoral growth and its impact on hip displacement to help us to fine tune, well, who are the patients who really benefit from femoral guided growth and which ones is it just not going to help? I don't think we fully understand that, although I think we're getting an idea and we'll share some of that knowledge with you when we get it. This really requires a randomized control trial, though. And uh, I think there's enough, enough studies out, there's enough smoke there to say, it looks like it's doing something good, but let's do a randomized control trial to really make sure of that uh, before we let it just go off to the masses. We need a long-term assessment of that, of that guided growth as well. We need long-term surveillance studies after skeletal maturity for those ambulatory patients I mentioned ago, as I mentioned there. Is an MP of 30% okay in someone who is GMFCS level two? Or should we treat them more like DDH? I mean, we would never accept uh, a, a subluxation in a child with DDH and let them go into adulthood. We know that's not going to work out okay. Why would it be okay for an ambulatory child with who also has spasticity and increased joint reaction forces? It doesn't make sense to me. I think we need to figure that out and be more proactive in those patients. Bony reconstruction is best after age six. We talked about that. Um, but we need to know more about, um, you know, uh, whether or not uh, these younger ages of bony reconstruction is as bad as we think. 
So I want to thank you all for this. I'm sorry I went a little bit over time. I had a lot to cover, um, and I talked a bit fast. But uh, by all means, if anyone has any questions for me or wants to reach out, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm at jason.howardatme.com. So uh, you can and certainly get my details from uh, Dr. Gunjwala or Dr. Shaw. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for the excellent the overviews of what we know and what we don't know and what is the future. It is a... It's raised a lot of questions on the, our audience. Actually, I will ask from behalf of others that the first question from me, Jane has asked, would it be possible to modulate the version of proximal femur as well as using the growth modulation? Sorry, would it be possible to? I Correct. didn't hear that. Version, version, modulate oh, version. the version. Gotcha. Uh, you know, that's another I guess I should put that on what we don't know as well. What happens to the version? We look very closely at the two-dimensional images because that's what we have. But really, we need to do uh, some CT scanning or other modalities to be able to really work out what goes on with the version. I can tell you that in these little children, you know, the femoral neck is very small, uh, particularly if you're putting in an eight. We have as young as 18. I think our youngest was 17 months. And uh, it's a pretty small femoral neck. So uh, to get it directly in the center is not always simple. So sometimes we do uh, have it uh, air a little bit to one side or the other. But if you're going to air, I would suggest that you air a little bit anterior with the idea that that little tethering anteriorly may allow the femoral neck to grow out into some, you know, to reduce that antiversion. Uh, I have no real data for that. Uh, I do see it on some of the post-operative x-rays. When you look at the frog-like view, you get a sense of it. I think something is happening, but we haven't quantified it yet. But I do think something is happening there. Okay. The question from our Rudra Prasad, that what all soft tissue release we can do along with the growth modulation? Yeah, I you know, a lot of times... You know, 85% of the kids that we treat for hip displacement will have adductor spasticity and contractures. So we do uh, do the adductor releases for those kids in addition to the guided growth. Uh, and that's good for positioning. That's good for diapering. And it also gets the hip out of that position. You know, I think part of it is what the adductor spasticity and hip flexor spasticity does. It positions the hip. Uh, you know, it's not the whole reason why the hip comes out of the joint. Uh, I think that is related to the proximal femoral growth um, for, to the greater extent, but it does position. So that's where your instability is going to happen. That's where your dysplasia is going to happen. So um, getting the hip more centered, I think, is better uh, for that. It does help to uh, get that hip more, um, a, a better distribution of forces about it early on. So, yes, we totally do the adductor releases. And what we are currently doing is, uh, we're just looking at our preliminary results or early term results, looking at those kids that have had adductor hip flexor releases and guided growth matched to a cohort that is uh, does not did not get the guided growth but got the adductor releases. And I think that'll give us an indication of what's happening. Uh, it's not a randomized controlled trial, but we have large numbers, which I think we'll be able to get a good idea. But we'll need some longer term follow up too. Yeah. Did you want to ask something? Yeah, uh, you said that in some of the kids you do it at a very young age, one and a half year. Uh, That's right. Yeah, so like uh, GMFCS level, as I understand, it's very unreliable to determine at very young age. So fine, like GMFCS five, we can we can make out very young, but I think that one and a half year is is bit uh, too early, or you are too aggressive for. Uh, like uh, going for this procedure. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I, I also, I agree with you. And um, our reason to go to one and a half, I mean, not many of them are one and a half years, you know, but we have a lot of two and a half years old, two and a half to three would be more common age. And those, t the kids who are three and under tend to do the best. Uh, we're also treating those kids who have pretty significant hip dysplasia that you know, in, in a kid who's severely involved, who you know is going to be a GMFCSL5, uh, 
you know, very poor trunk and head control. Those are the kids that you know, okay, I can leave it like this and it, it'll dislocate. But once it dislocates, now I have a different discussion because dislocation, you can't leave it out for very long. The cartilage degenerates, everything gets tighter, diaper gets to be a problem. You turn something that could be a, you know, you turn it into an open reduction and with all the risks involved with that. So we don't, we didn't have great, great options for that. You don't want to do VDROs at that age, you know, like you would do for, you want to do the stuff like you do for a DDH kid. So, so for us, the guided growth has really been very helpful. It's a very small operation. You can do it in kids who are very medically challenged and it has very low morbidity. We've had absolutely no complications with it. I worry about the risk of fracture in those small femurs. I haven't had it yet. We use stiffy rules, um, you know, where you stay, your entry points above the lesser trochanter to make sure you don't get that. Um, But I'm sure we'll get one at some point. But I agree with you. I I was also very wary, but I can tell you the results are best in the young ones. And that's what we're going to find. The younger they are, the better they do. I wouldn't put one in, for example, someone who's 18 months of age and who's got good head control and starting to get good head trunk control. Because you with the acquisition of normal weight bearing over time, some of that early hip displacement can, uh, can uh, improve, can actually go back to maybe not normal, but close to normal. So we would wait that out and see, I'm not talking about the kid who has 30 to 40% at 18 at two years of age. I'm talking about the kid who has 60, 70% or 50% or more that, you know, is just not going to improve. So this is a good, I, I think this is a good option for them. We still need to look at our data very carefully, look at it over the lo- longer term. But thus far, we've had really very minimal complications. I think it's tough to do technically in those little ones. And uh, we didn't start there, uh, but uh, it's a good option in my hands for that group. But we need to do more due diligence on making sure that it's a lasting uh, thing for them and doesn't give them any problems. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah. 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 Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. With that question, I can ask that, uh, the Jason, how do you differentiate between infantile hip dislocation in CP with uh, dysplasia and JMFCS5? Yeah, you know, sometimes that is difficult and we do see them uh, happen concurrently. Yeah. There is a different appearance to the um, you know, it's hard to quantify, and maybe this is a, be a good study to look at that. But there is a different different appearance to the to the femur. You, you, you know, it has very much that appearance that it has in a you know missed hip dislocation for DDH has that similar appearance, and also the acetabular dysplasia is more dramatic early. You know, because it's an acetabular problem and secondarily a a, a femoral problem, but in in CP. It's the opposite. It's a it's a it's a femoral problem that leads to an acetabular problem. So I don't have a hard and fast. I certainly think about it, uh, and uh, in some and the other thing is a lot of times that hip won't go in the joint. So that's the other thing. It, you need an open reduction in a young kid who needs an open reduction with a high dislocation. You probably got a DDH on top of that CP. I'm lucky for that kid. So those are the things. I'm lucky enough to treat both of those diagnosis. Um, and so I have a reasonable sense of that, but sometimes it'd be tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. One more question. Uh, would you consider the bilateral surgery for all or you change with the GMFCS? Uh, in, I in will, unilateral dislocation, would you do on contralateral for all the patient or would you do only on GMFCS 4 and 5? Everybody who is a GMFCS of 4 and 5, I would do bilateral. In GMFCS level three, I think you also need to, to do bilateral for most cases because, you know, they are more involved and their risk of hip displacement is, as you know, about 45%. Uh, so if you got on one side, there's a high risk it's going to come out on the other and you will get that pelvic obliquity, which have an impact on their gait. They often need derotational osteotomies anyways for gait correction uh, on both sides. So it's usually an easy decision. In the GMFCS level twos, um, a lot of times what we find you've got, you need, you'll do a hip, hip x-ray before you do gait correction surgery for derotational osteotomy. And you see that one of them is 30, 40% uncovered. 
And then in addition to your de-irritation, you'll tuck a little bit of varus in there. It's very unusual to see a unilateral hip displacement that you pick up on, on um, surveillance x-rays that you treat in isolation of gait. Uh, and the timing usually works out about the right time. Hemiplegics, however, are different stories. So if you have a, someone who is hemiplegic, and especially like someone who's got a winter gauge Hicks 4, where you've got you know, femoral antiversion around that adolescent growth spurt, that hip starting to come out of the joint, cause discomfort. Unilateral for that one, for sure. You often need an acetabular procedure as well, uh, which in, in our hands is typically like a triple pelvic type osteotomy. Um, you know, because this is an ambulatory patient uh, and uh, they often have uncoverage there. That's not just, uh, you just can't get it with just the VDRO alone. Uh, but that's sort of my, yeah. I mean, I would say in pretty well all cases bilateral, but think about it. Uh, if you only do unilateral, think about, well, am I going to make a, am I going to cause pelvic obliquity because I've shortened one side and left the other side long? And that can lead to some long leg dysplasia, which probably is a positioning issue that makes it come out of the joint. You know, I'm sure that's part of it. So balance is best in CP. In, in bilateral CP, you probably should do bilateral procedures. Yeah, it continues to that question. Would you change your angle uh, if it is one hip is more subluxated, one hip is less subluxated? So would you balance both for the maintaining pelvic obliquity or would you do the same? Uh, usually I will, you know, I'll usually try and just, if I have someone with, with diplegia, for example, who's got one head, that's about 35% uncovered. The other one's 10% on MP. I'll tip the one on the, uh, on the display side down to about 120. Yeah. And on the other side, I probably leave it around 130. Um, I, I wouldn't completely overcover one. Because then you worry a little bit, well, if I overcover it, am I going to get into problems with impingement? You know, so uh, I don't want to, I'll, I'll make sure that I level the, the, um, the leg length. So, and you can do that by shortening the bone too, as well. Okay. But usually we don't have to. That little 10 degree change doesn't give you that much of a leg length discrepancy. Yeah, that's kind of. One more question. The, the ilio swas release, swas release, uh, when will you do it? What is the need for the iliosphalus contraction release in every hip subluxation or when it's selective? Um, it depends because if it's a hypotonic kid, of course, you don't have to do anything. No adductors, no hip hip uh, flexors. But if you have a kid who's GMFCS level fours or five, there's almost invariably in addition to adductor uh, spasticity and contracture, there's a hip flexion contracture and a proximal hamstring contracture. So we, I usually do all three. If if it's a non-ambulatory kid, I will release the the entire tendon at the lesser trochanter. If they're ambulatory, uh, and I have to do the adductors, I'll still do the the um, hip flexors through that approach, but they're usually a little more muscle belly. At the at the lesser troke in those ambulatory kids, they just got more muscle there. So you can do a psoas recession uh, right at the lesser troke, and I don't think it weakens them too much. So I I was a big fan of doing like you know above the brim, uh, over the brim, or a Sutherland type approach, or the approach that Paulo Selber taught me uh, that they use at Gillette. But you know I I've kind of moved away from it because I think I can do a little higher dose. And uh, but I don't over weaken them through the groin, and we're often having to do the adductors as well. But yeah, so I usually do the, my the answer is I usually do the three adductor longest for sure, plus or minus the brevis, uh, plus uh, and plus hip flexor and the gracilis, and I'll add the brevis in as a, usually a partial myotomy, always protecting the obturator nerve. By the way, I never do anything to that. There's nothing worse than an abduction contracture. But we'll, our goal is to get equal abduction of about 60 degrees on both sides. And we get that. We, then we take away 40 degrees. We've got 20 left over, and that's usually good. That's balances between overdoing it and underdoing it. Right? Have you ever, any time you face the issues with like uh, abduction contraction in non ambulance Yes. In fact, this week, uh, you know, as I... We mentioned here earlier, I did um, 
we did bilateral anterior hip dislocations associated with what Dr. Miller would classify as a type two, where you've got wide hip abduction and external rotation. So they've got external rotation contractures now and the, the severe antiversion and the femoral heads coming out the front with severe anterolateral acetabular dysplasia, like you would see in the worst DDH case you have. Um, so the pro with, in that case, that child had adductor releases at age two. And now mind you, he's, he's, he's 10 now, he's 10 years age now. So eight years ago, had adductor releases and had an obturator neurectomy and went on to severe unopposed abduction. Even those, uh, those abductors are weak, they still have something. And the external rotators are still reasonably strong. So when we tried to actually do the case, the, the child had about minus 20 degrees of internal rotation on the uh, more dislocated side. So we had to do an external rotators release as well as release the gluteal sling kind of through like an extended retinac or flap type idea. Uh, so to just to get the motion to be able to derotate it. So it makes it uh, much more challenging. And it just goes to show that dosing in surgery is so important. You know, you really shouldn't be uh, giving such a high dose of surgery that your kid does this because that's not good for sitting. They're sitters. If they can't bring their legs to the midline uh, and they're externally rotated like a frog, um, you know, that's, that's not functionally good for sitting, for positioning. And this child, for example, had quite a bit of pain associated. And I'm sure I didn't open his hip joint, but I'm sure that his cartilage in the front is pretty delaminated. It looked uh, round enough to put it in and we put it in. Um, but so, yes, you have to be careful. I would suggest forget about the obturator nerve. Just do a good, good uh, release. Let the obturator nerve do its thing. You don't need to put phenol or anything on it. Uh, I haven't had any issues with that. So just do a proper release to get them to 60 degrees and call it and make it equal. The last two questions. Would you do any MRI to assess the cartilage? And the second, what will you do for recurrent dislocation? Two last questions. Yeah, so MRI, MRI would, be, would be really neat. And I thought about that early on, um, looking at doing like degenerate studies and things like that, like they do in the hip, hip uh, preservation world. Uh, but the problem is that you're dealing with kids who have comorbidities, who are GMFC level fours and fives, who've got spasticity. They need a general anesthetic to get a good MRI. And it just seems like the risks outweigh the benefits. Uh, at the end of the day, we an arthrogram can tell you a lot about what's going on with the hip as well, intraoperatively. And, and, and a CT can give you a good idea of the femoral head shape. It doesn't tell you enough about the cartilage. One of the things that uh, I have been talking with my um, our hip arthroscopist, Alvin Sue, is doing a um, hip arthroscopy for those cases where we're on the fence, whether or not we should reconstruct or do salvage. So we haven't done one yet, but we're I'm trying to get the right one for him. And the plan is to do it just through a medial groin approach. So uh, we'll uh, if we do that, we'll 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 kind of share that a little bit our experience with it. Uh, I think that would be one, one thing to be very useful to know. Uh, the second question was uh, what is about revision? Yeah. So what to do about it? Yeah. I mean, I guess it, you have to assess what the residual deformity is and what's been done previously. A lot of times when you have revisions, the, the things I find are uh, that someone, you know, has either done it too early. So they've done it at age four. And now you're back again at age 10 or 11 with a recurrent subluxation dislocation. Those ones are not too bad. I think, you know, you have to have, obviously have the plate out. Uh, I usually take the plate out, let it, let the holes heal, and then do an arthrogram and examination under anesthesia to see what's the, what's the problem? Where's the instability? What's the geometry? and then plan it that way, and then come back uh, and uh, do the uh, reconstruction. I always get a CT scan in the revision cases, but not always in the primary cases, and see, well, where, where are the deficits? Where's the acetabular dysplasia? Do you have a recurrence of that coxa valga? A lot of times, the ones that are done young, they have a recurrence of coxa valga. They've got a recurrence of their femoral antiversion, and they've got a recurrence of the acetabular dysplasia. So you're back to square one, 
but with a whole bunch more scar tissue. But you can deal with that. I think those ones, the principles are the same. Um, and at usually at that age, you don't have to come back again. So just do a good job. Make sure you know the femoral head is in good shape. And um, if you can reconstruct it, reconstruction is always better than salvage. The Did second... Anybody? The second type of patient that I see, which is more difficult, is the one where they've had a surgery which was not appropriate. Uh, the ones we've had too much antiversion, the retroverted uh, proximal femur, I've had to derotate them back into antiversion. Uh, and those are ones that also have severe uh, uh, external rotation contractures. The ones that have overaggressive releases as well, uh, ductor releases, and now abduction contractures. I've had to do things like tensor fascia lateral releases to help with the abduction, at least the gluteal sling. Um, and then also the acetab acetabulum, I've seen the acetabulum be antiverted rather than retroverted. And that gives you a whole bunch of, or, or sorry, retroverted rather than antiverted, I meant to say. And that makes it very difficult because now you've had someone who's done an acetabuloplasty, they've, they've covered it more anteriorly like you would do with a salter and very deficient now at the back, worse than it ever was when they started. Trying to get that back is very difficult. So you end up having to do something like a redirectional osteotomy, like a triple pelvic osteotomy, but with soft bone and with an acetabulum that's shaped more like a plate and less like a cup. So you're, I think it, those are extremely difficult situations. I have one actually now that I've tried to undo what was done before. And I've got it as best as it can, but it's still a little unstable at the back. And so she wears a brace. And then at some point, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to excise her proximal femoral head and probably do a, a McHale type procedure. So tough. The best thing to do is to avoid revision is get your timing right. Don't do it too early. And, and really pay attention to your um, intraoperative uh, technical reduction of antiversion and where you do your acetabuloplasty. Make sure you know where the deficiency is. Remember, about 55% of them are posterior lateral, but 35% are anterior and 80% are global. So if you can't tell that intraoperatively yourself through experience, then you should get a CT scan to make sure you know about that. And then plan accordingly. I find the San Diego acetab acetabuloplasty that, that releases the cortex anteriorly at the inner ileum, and at the static notch gives you the most versatility to be able to get correction wherever you need it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you very much. It's almost 12 o'clock and I think a lot of questions would be there, but we can send you by mail. Thank you very much for your time and presence. What do you then by you can say the last? Yeah, thank you very much, Jashan, for sharing your vast experience with us. And uh, still there are a few questions, but uh, I, I know that you have to rush for the clinic. So I will email you those questions and sure. you can reply them and then we will circulate the answer with our fellows. So once again, thank you very much for coming to the session and sharing your vast experience. You know, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And um, I'm very happy to do this for you. And uh, it's been a great honor for me. So looking forward to do more in the future. Sure, definitely. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. All the best. Thanks.